I, I'm so happy that everybody's on board tonight to listen to some good storytelling. You know, growing is, is hard work. And now that we have our seeds back, that we um, will never lose them. And that one day it'll uh, be able to feed our, our local community and then some. Um, and none of this could have, would have happened really. Uh, I'm pretty confident to say um, without all that beautiful work that um, these gardeners have provided. And um, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to think about, uh, you know, why we're, we are still, you know, growing in Nebraska um, once in a while, I'm confronted with the question of, of are we going to keep growing in Nebraska? And uh, uh, so I, I'd like to illustrate very briefly why we will always grow in Nebraska, I hope. Um, this is a shadow box. And we filled it with um, some dirt. And on this side, uh, it's, you can tell it's a little darker. Um, and this is from Dale Fike's land. And on the other side is where Ronnie grows her garden. Well, right in the middle, that bright red uh, depiction, it's not a depiction of Mars, but but it could be, um, but that's our Oklahoma soil. That, that's red clay. And that is, this soil depiction alone is kind of tells that the soil is so different. And we know that in the 17 years that we've been growing in Nebraska and Oklahoma, that our plants always do better in Nebraska. Um, I'd like to describe that sometime as, as just simply calling it uh, soil memory. Um, and you know yourselves that when you look at a package of seeds, it'll tell you what climate, what region the seeds grow best uh, in. And uh, that's pretty much uh, like our, our Pawnee corn. Um, it just does well. Um, and, you know, Oklahoma does a, a, a real purpose. At least we can weaken the seed down here so that it will it'll shout out uh, some new varieties, perhaps. And then we can take those new varieties up to Nebraska and grow them out proper. I, I have a question uh, about something that Deb said, and maybe uh, any of you gardeners or Ronnie could uh, address this, but there was a statement made, and I've heard it made before, that weakening the corn has something to do with helping varieties come out of that, that one variety. It is part of the process of create, creating, or in this case, recreating uh, varieties that are somehow locked up in that one that gets unlocked in the weakening. Can you say something, someone uh, address something more about that? I can start with that one. Anybody else can add? Uh, Jerry's an agronomist himself, so he might be able to add some things to that too. But what we've discovered is that the latest varieties that the Pawnee were working with were varieties that they created from ancient varieties. They're more ancient varieties over hundreds of years. I, you know, I don't know how long it takes <laughs> to create one. We couldn't, we didn't know why, couldn't explain why, but then all of a sudden reading those records, we, we knew what was going on. So all of a sudden from 2017, when we had eight varieties 
it's 2020 now and we have 16 because boom, once we figured out uh, how to take the strong varieties that the Pawnee had here and as they were weakening because we didn't have enough seeds to work with, at, you know, because you should have an eighth of an acre at least to strengthen. Uh, we just have not had enough seeds for years. It's taken a long time. It's been a long process. So we started weakening in some areas. Some soil weakens the corn more than other soil. Uh, we've discovered that too. So, which has been a wonderful thing. Oklahoma weakens, uh, weakens things and, and my goodness, we can get all kinds of speckled kernels now to work with if, if it's grown in Oklahoma. So it has a purpose. Blue corn was grown in a field. It took seven years worth of seeds to plant three acres. It took us seven years to get enough seeds to plant seven acres, a five gallon bucket of corn, seven years. The corn's teaching us what to do uh, just by watching the corn and paying attention to what it's doing. It, it's, it's our best teacher. Uh, everything that we see coming out of this corn that's more ancient than what they had created while they were here in Nebraska, matched what was written in the Weltfish book, Weltfish's book, or what was written in Will and Hyde. There's no other tribe's corn coming out of this. It's all Pawnee, which really says, it proves what the Pawnee have always said all along. We didn't trade our corn. We, you know, we didn't mix anybody else's corn with ours. It's been ours and ours alone, and we've kept it. And that's the only corn coming out of this. There's nothing else coming out of it but Pawnee varieties that have all been documented. It's really cool to see. Uh, there's, there's a couple of threads I'd like to see if I can tie together here. Um, <clears throat> I'm a retired uh, mental health and substance abuse counselor. And one of the things I've looked at in, uh, in my active career was historical trauma. And I know that the story that we're talking about and alluding to is that kind of a story. So I wanna point out that uh, there's two sides to pretty much every coin. And on one side is the trauma and on the other side is the resilience. And they both need to be taken together. And I was interested in hearing about the, uh, the corn. Uh, so when I try to talk about these things, I get, I get pretty emotional. But the corn uh, going down to Oklahoma and uh, being weakened there. But out of that weakening uh, comes a, uh, a return to an old diversity and a, a thriving and a potential for, for thriving again. And I want to acknowledge that and, and point out a lot of Pawnee people uh, think of animals and plants as, as relatives. Uh, buffalo uh, are our relatives and the corn is a relative. And there's some kind of lesson being taught here uh, about uh, suffering and, and about uh, weakening and then about thriving. It's, it's like the, the corn relatives are telling us something that can happen not just to them, but to us, their relatives. So there's a story here. If I had to, if I had to point to say, what does reconciliation and, and uh, healing look like in a boots on the ground, practical kind of application way? I would have to say, 
I can't find a clearer uh, example than this. Uh, Ronnie's, your legacy of coming from a family of allies and your, your work today of, and Deb's work, your joint work of uh, creating a network of allies in our very homeland. Um, well, as you can tell, I deeply uh, feel that. I, uh, I want to say that when you touch on the, the topics of a, a painful, unjust, brutal history, and then there it is. And what do you do? What do you do next? In the recovery world, we talk about doing the next right thing. And that's where uh, recovery begins. That's where healing begins. And being able to hear the story and take those next right steps is where reconciliation begins. And I just want to address the uh, ne Nebraska people here and, and say, in, in my estimation, you are allies and you're working in a bigger picture than maybe you know. Maybe you have thought about it and, and maybe you haven't, but I wanted to uh, acknowledge that in the, the clearest way that I could. So uh, that's my thanks to you, Ronnie, uh, doing what you've done, sharing what you've shared and uh, everyone that has shown up to participate in hearing you out. Uh, there's there's a, a very beautiful story. You, writing a different end to a tragic story is always beautiful. So thank you, thank you all. BC had mentioned uh, uh, the passing of elders recently, and uh, one of them is uh, Francis Morse, um, who served many years as uh, a chief. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he was a tough chief to work with. You know, he was uh, one of the chiefs, well, he was the uh, eldest chief on the council. And so the other chiefs always looked up to him. And uh, uh, he uh, didn't always agree with what I was wanting to do. Uh, and uh, it wasn't too long ago, but uh, a year, year ago, maybe, um, I uh, went to go see him. Uh, he's, he was staying at the same place my mom was, is at now. And uh, um, he told me, he said, uh, you know, he got emotional too. And he, he said uh, that, uh, he told me that, you know, that, that he didn't always agree with what I was doing. Um, he felt like uh, when we moved to Oklahoma that, that we had uh, lost traditions uh, that we should never try to do again. We put bundles in museums and we don't open them up and use them because we don't know how. We don't have that, that teaching with it. Uh, and he felt like the corn was in the same category that that was a thing we did in Nebraska and we no longer have it. But here comes Deb and she doesn't go away. She kept coming to all the meetings and, you know, you just kept coming back, he said, you coming back. And 
and explaining what was going on and how the corn wanted to live again. And um, he apologized to me with tears and said, I'm so sorry I gave you such a hard time. And I see what you're doing and it's good. And I just had to tell you that, you know, so uh, it's always uh, those, those kind of things are always heartfelt. Mm 